Um, but this morning I'm here to teach you guys out of Romans chapter 8. If you guys open your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 31 through 39. Romans chapter 8. Uh, today's message, I've entitled this message, Love Without Measure. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall separate us, or rather, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge was completed, and it cost over $35 million to complete. And it was completed in two phases. The first phase, it was completed in a, in a the first phase was a very fast-paced phase. The second was very slow. Now, in the first phase, they did not have any kind of safety net for these workers. And unfortunately, that led to 23 deaths because they fell. Uh, unfortunately, it was an accident, but they fell to their deaths, and uh, so they did not have anything set. But at the last part of the project, they actually did set a safety net as a precaution, and 10 men fell to that net, and they were spared. They lived. Now, when they actually in, uh, put this net in place, the production actually increased by 25%. Why? Well, because these men actually had the assurance of their security and also that they were free to wholeheartedly serve the project. They did not have to worry about falling into that water because of that safety net. When we talk about security, security is a very important element in life. In fact, there might be some here tonight or today who are probably living an insecure life. Uh, perhaps you were a victim of a crime such as a robbery. You were robbed. Now you're insecure. Now as you walk around, you're, you're looking around your surroundings, you're, you're kind of keeping an eye out on people because you don't trust people. You're living in an insecure life because of that incident. Now on a personal level, maybe you're lacking marital security. Or perhaps it's a job security. And, and when you think about these areas in life where we want security, we realize that we really have no security in these areas that we need most. Fortunately, in the single area that truly matters, our relationship with God, you can have security. And the security that I'm talking about, it's the security of God's love towards you. That God loves you. And we have that security, and this is what we're going to be looking at here. You see, the Bible declares very, very clearly that God offers believers his unconditional love and acceptance. And I believe that this is an important part of the Christian life. I like how one man once described the love of God. He said this, the love of God is like the Amazon River flowing down to water one daisy. The power of God's love. The reality of God's love. Now, in Scripture... One of the people that I see that got a hold of God's love, who really grasped the depths of God's love, was a man by the name of Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was a man who truly came to grips with God's love. In fact, it was him who wrote this in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. What an amazing declaration. It's the love of Christ, he says, that compels us. Remember, Paul hated Christians. Remember that? He hated Christians with a passion. 
Even in Acts chapter 9, when he got right with God, when God saved him, God went to a man by the name of Ananias and said, Ananias, I need you to go and lay hands on this man, Saul. Ananias said, are you serious? Do you know who this guy is? This guy hates us. He's not one of us, and he's going to kill me. Of course, he didn't realize that God already transformed his life, but yet he was afraid of Paul. And I would too. And so you, so you, would, you, you, you will too. I mean, if you actually knew who Paul was before, you would actually be afraid of him too. He hated Christians with a passion. Well, we see that Paul the Apostle came to grips with God's love. And in Romans chapter 8 is a powerful chapter out of this book here, this entire Romans book. Chapter 8 here, Paul shares something super important for all Christians. In fact, Romans 31, or chapter 8, verse 31 through 39, I say it may be the most, it's probably the most comforting and encouraging portion in Scripture throughout the entire Bible. Because this chapter, this verse here, gives us some depth to God's love. Now, there are three big no-nos of the Christian faith here in this chapter. And I'm going to be sharing these three big no-nos, but from verses 31 to 39. And the big three no-nos of the Christian faith that I want you to understand are these. No opposition, no condemnation, and no separation. Those are the three big no-nos of the Christian faith. That's what I'm calling them. Now, the chapter 8, a chapter 8 here in Romans, Paul told us that we've been adopted into a family. He also talked about glory awaiting us as we, when we die, we're glorified. He talked about us, that God works things for good, all things. And then he paints this huge picture of God's sovereignty in the middle of this chapter. Then he talks about the reality that Christians are more than conquerors, and then he tells us why we are more than conquerors. His answer is the high point. His answer, I believe, is the grand truth of the Christian faith. It's the grand truth of the Christian faith. So let's look at the first big no-no in the Christian life. No opposition. Notice what he says in verse 31. He says this, what, shall, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a question and answer format. These verses 31 through 39, it's a question and answer format, and these questions are very personal. It's like he's asking you personally. And, and not only that, but there are a total of seven questions that Paul asks in this section. And the first question is, what shall we say to these things? Paul is saying all the things that I've already laid out in chapter 8, from verse 1 all the way down here to verse 30. He says, what shall we say to these things? Now, Paul is so astounded by God's unconditional love that he's calling his readers to respond say something. And I find that interesting because I believe that when we look at the Bible, the Bible is written in a way for man to respond, to say something. When you share the scriptures with a non-Christian, you're waiting for a response from them. What do you think about this? You see, the Bible, the, it's not a book of information for us to file away. It, 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 it's a book that we are to receive, read, and apply. James even said that. In James chapter 1, verse 22, he says, be doers of the word. He says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James says, listen, you read the Bible, do something about it. Obey it. And even our own Lord said this in John chapter 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not just something that we just take in and put away in the back of our mind and just live the way we want to live. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are held accountable to this book, God's holy word. And God is calling us to do something about what we read. When the Bible says something about loving God or something about staying away from here or from that, he wants us to respond. He wants us to just obey that rather than just taking in the scriptures just for information's sake. So Paul says, what shall we say to these things? And here it is. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Notice Paul doesn't ask the question, who is against us? He says, and he, he actually qualifies the question with the phrase, if God is for us. I want to say something here important about the word if in the Greek. The word if in the Greek is not a term of uncertainty, but of certainty. Paul is saying this, if God is working on our behalf, and he is, then who could succeed in opposing us? That's what he's saying. 
remember in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was confronted by Satan and, and Satan said, if you are the son of God, remember that, he would use that, if you are the son of God, that same word if in the Greek is the same word here. It's, 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 a, it's a term of certainty. Satan is saying, since you're the son of God, turn these rocks into bread. That's what he's saying. It's not like Satan didn't know who Jesus was. He knew exactly who he was. But he was saying, since you are. And here Paul is saying the same thing. Since God is for us, who in the world can be against you? That's what he's trying to tell us. In spite of who or what comes against you, God is for you. This is only for Christians, for, 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 for uh, uh, born-again believers, because he uses the word us. Us qualifies anybody that is born again, that God is for us. He said this in chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. He used the term us to refer to believers. Verse 12, 14, 24, 26, 28, and then 29 to 30, he uses that word us, 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 because he's talking to us Christians, believers. To know that God is for us is such a relief, don't you think? To know that the God of the universe is for you, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty cool. I I'm stoked about that. That's awesome. That, that, that the God who created this entire universe, the heavens, and even myself, he created me. He's for me. So whom, should I, whom shall I fear? And we see here that it's, it's something that he's talking about here. Paul, he's, he's, he's making it clear to us. As he says, he made reference to this in chapter 8, verse 28, when he says that all things work together for good. Again, clearly showing to us that God works for our good. It's, he's not against us, which is also emphasizing that this is a continuing activity of God, that he's constantly going for you, or, or, or constantly uh, for you. Now, the only time God is against you is when you're in sin. When you are outside of the parameters of God's holy holiness, I guess, if you will, that's when God is against you. You see, what happened to the church in Ephesus is that they left their first love. We read that in Revelation. And listen to this. Jesus said this to them, Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So, the only time God is against you is when you're in sin. And he's only against you for the fact that he's trying to bring you to repentance. He's showing you that you're in the wrong, and he's trying to encourage you to get right with him, to repent to make things right with him. That's the only time he's against you because he's trying to get you to repent. And that's exactly what happened in the church in Ephesus. And, and this is what we see here is that Jesus is saying to these guys, I have this against you, but repent. I'm against what you're doing. I'm against where you're at, but, but I want you to repent because I want you to have a right relationship with me. Another example of a person in Scripture whom God went against was Jonah. Remember Jonah? Good old Jonah, right? We know that story, right? Jonah was asked to go to, the, to Nineveh to preach to the Assyrians, who were horrible people. And yet Jonah said, I don't want to go there. I can't stand those people. They can go to hell, basically, is what he said. He went the, up, the opposite way. And what did God do? He went against Jonah, right? He went into the boat. What was the very first thing God created against Jonah? A storm. The storm came in. That didn't work. Because Jonah says, throw me into the waters. I know why this storm is happening. It's kind of like kicking somebody out of the house. Like, you know what? With all this stuff's going on. Get out of here, right? But that's what Jonah did. Threw him in the water. But yet, God wasn't done, right? God didn't allow him to die. What happened? Jaws came, right? Not Jaws, but you know what I mean. A fish, <laughs> right? A fish came in and swallowed him up. And Jonah finally hit rock bottom. And that is where God spoke to him. And that's where he came to grips with God's mercy and realized, whoa, you really went against me, God. I wanted to do my own thing. But you know the whole story. Jonah was given another chance. We see here that when God is against us, it's because he, we are in sin. Now, there are times that it feels like God is against us. Because maybe you're here today and you're saying, Robert, you know what? I'm going through a hard time right now in life. I really feel like God is against me. 
Everything that's been going on in my life has just been going bad. I mean, things are just not going the right way. I, 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 I don't know if I believe you. I think God is really against me right now. I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm not in sin. I love Jesus. But everything that's happening in my life, the things that are falling apart, I don't know. I think he's against me. Naomi went through something like that. She lost her husband and to her two children. And she basically came to the conclusion, like she said this, God has dealt very bitterly with me. It's like, God, it's against me. This is, this is a bitter situation, and it was. I mean, losing not only your husband, but your children is horrible. I've never gone through that. I pray that I will never go through that, but she did. And maybe some of you here have gone through that. But see, Naomi finally came to grips that God wasn't against her. God was doing something greater in her life, behind the scenes. And this is what she said in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. She said this, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. She came to that understanding that, listen, God wasn't against me. It was hard, though. This was a horrible, horrible trial. But yet he was working something greater behind the scenes of my life. And that is what's happening with you today. You're going through a hard time in your life right now. Listen, God is working something greater behind all of this. Trust him. And here's where we apply this, this text. That God loves you. And he's not, he's not against you, but he's for you. Another person that comes to mind when it comes to feeling like God is against us is Joseph, a young man who God gave him a big dream he was going to be the one who was going to basically uh, lead his family superior than his brothers and whatnot. They didn't like that. And what happened? His brothers wanted to kill him, right? And they threw him into this dry well, this dark pit, and he was there stuck. They wanted him just to die. But yet, instead, they pulled him back out and they sold him as a slave. And he went in this crazy journey. Here he is. Imagine what Joseph was going through in his mind. God, you called me to this and you gave me dreams. Was it you speaking to me? Was it not? I feel like you're against me now. And yet, God was working something greater because we have the big picture, right? We can go into Genesis and see it all, right? We're like, no, 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 Joseph, listen. Way down in chapter 50, you're going to see what's going on here. And he came to that understanding himself. And notice what he said this in Genesis 50, speaking to his brothers, verse 20. But as for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. God wasn't against him. God is for you. The only time he's against you is when you're in sin because he wants you to repent. And he'll create circumstances in your life to bring you back. That's what he will do. But as we walk with God, not in a perfect life because we won't be perfect, yet God is for us, not against us. And Paul here answers this first question with a rhetorical question, and he says this in verse 32. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The cross is the measure of God's love. And he's making it very clear that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die in your place. To die for your sins clearly shows you that God is for you, not against you. For God to sent Christ from heaven to leave eternity, to come here and to walk among us sinful people and to be pinned on a cross shows that God is for you, not against you. John 3.16, right? It's a Bible in a nutshell. For God so loved the world. The object of God's love is the world. And he was the initiator of love. He's the one who says, I'm going to go down and offer an opportunity for my people, for my creation, my master creation, to get back in a right relationship with me by sending my son to be the final sacrifice. Now, I do want to say this, though. This term, freely give, the word here means to bestow out of grace, and it, perhaps it could mean to forgiveness, which is an act of God's grace. I mean, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. I love that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, we also see here these all things, and I want to just kind of make a quick little side note here. This all things here does not include Rolls Royces and Jets, elaborate jewelry, all right? Because there's a theology out there, the, the, the prosperity theology, 
that says that when you come to Jesus, you're going to be rich. You're going to get material possessions. Now, there are people that are rich, wealthy people, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with wealth. As long as you honor God with your wealth, that's what the Bible says you're supposed to do. If wealth corrupts you, you're in the wrong spot. You're not going to go anywhere with that. But the Bible doesn't talk against, it's not against riches. It's just the way we handle them and how we honor God with them. But, but this, this all things who he's freely given us doesn't speak about us praying over that Bentley that we want, right? Because there's, there's pastors that will encourage their congregation and say, if you want that car, pray for it in Jesus. You know, and all of a sudden, people get all crazy about it. That's not what this text is saying. Because those word of faith teachers will take this text and say, see, he has freely given you all things. It's like God is like, you know, you get your little lamp, your genie lamp, and you rub it. This is what I want, God. And he pops out and says, sure, what do you want? That's not what this text says. This text is very clear that since God gave the greatest gift, the greatest sacrifice of all, his son, it says clearly that he will certainly not hesitate to give believers all other things pertaining to and leading to their ultimate glorification. In other words, you have been given everything that you need to live the Christian life through the Holy Spirit. That is why Paul says confidently in Philippians chapter 1, verse 16, he says, being confident of this very same thing, he says, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, why is he so confident? Because we've been given the things that we need to live that Christian life. And we see here that this is what Paul is actually encouraging us about, that Christ has bestowed out of his grace all these wonderful things. Now, the next two questions are more legal in nature, and we come to the second big no-no of the Christian faith, no condemnation. No condemnation. This is what he says in verse 33. Notice, who shall bring a charge against us or against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And he stops there. No condemnation. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The idea here is who could make a formal accusation in court or press charges against God's people? Do you know that Satan is considered the accuser of the brethren? Do you know that that jerk, and I can say that, do you know that that jerk accuses you before God every single day? Every time you blow it or you mess up or whatever, he says, ah, oh, look, at there's the Christian you saved. That's really the Christian? Look at this guy. Look at this girl. Look at him. And he, and he accuses us before God. But you see, Satan is going to be destroyed. He's going to be gone. And I like what God said. We see in Scripture, and John actually wrote this, Revelation 12, 10. He says this, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Satan's accusations will be thrown out of court because it is God who justifies. It's exactly what he says. The judge himself declares the accused person righteous on the basis of his faith in Jesus Christ. On the basis of his faith in Jesus Christ. So the question is this. Who would dare bring a charge against God's people? The answer is no one. When God justifies a soul, nobody can accuse them. Nobody can press charges, I guess, if you will. No one can successfully accuse someone whom God has declared righteous. That's what we see here. And as a result of all accusations, it's all dismissed. No one can bring that accusation because Christ is our defense attorney. And then he says in verse 34, who is he who condemns? To condemn means to declare guilty and sentenced to punishment. Kind of reminds me of that story in John chapter 8 and verse 11 and 12. Remember the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery? These guys somehow set this woman up or whatever. They knew something was up and they were there. That's gross, right? I mean, these guys were there. And they bring this woman to Jesus to see what Jesus is going to say. We caught her in the very act. Well, as they bring her over to Jesus, you know the whole story, right? I mean, Jesus began to, he, he started to doodle on the ground, and, and, and one by one, these guys left. We don't know what he wrote here. There's a lot of speculations. Perhaps every sin that they've committed, he's writing them, not every, but maybe some of the recent ones. We, we don't know, but, but whatever he wrote basically got them to leave. And then Jesus 
said this to the woman. Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And the woman said this, no one, Lord. And I love Jesus' response. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know how liberating that must have been for that woman? She thought she was going to get hammered. But, she's, but Jesus said, you know what? I don't condemn you. Listen, Jesus Christ, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's a fact. Romans 8.1. That's the way Paul starts this entire chapter. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Certainly the judge will not condemn his own. John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. See, Christians are not going to be judged. Do you hear that a lot? You know, are we going to be judged? No. We're going to be judged in the sense of rewards and, and our motives, what, what our motives were like when we served God, and then we're going to get rewards or uh, crowns and whatever. It, it's, it, that's what we're going to go through. The BBC of Christ, uh, that, that, that place of rewards, that's what we're going to go through. But we're not going to be judged anymore because that's been taken care of on the cross. So there's no judgment in the sense of like a judgment that a non-Christian will go through, a non-born-again person, they're going to be confronted with the wrath of God because they refuse to come to Christ. And we see here that certainly the judge will not condemn his own who are in faith, who are in him by faith. So Paul says it here that there is no, no opposition, no condemnation, and now he seals his argument by exclaiming that there is no separation. No separation. Here is the grand truth. Here is the liberating truth of the Christian faith. Listen to this, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The word separate is a very unique word. In fact, the Bible uses that word in other places to refer to a divorce between a man and a woman. When they're divorced, they separate. It's a totally a separation there. The word here, the root word here, means this, space or distance. So what this verse is saying is, can anything put dis a distance between you and God's love? Can anything put a distance between you and God's love? I mean, it sounds totally different now. I mean, this is potentially the most critical question a Christian can ask. Is there anything that, 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 that I can do that, that, that will just not, you know, how, Jesus Christ will not love me for? In other words, is there any space that, that I can have or when it comes to God's love? And of course, the answer is no. There's nothing on this earth that can stop Jesus from loving you. And I want you to understand, this is not about your love for God. It's God's love towards you. And the reason why I say this is because there are things in this life that can separate us from loving God. Sin. I mean, the last thing you want to do is love God when you're in sin. When you fail God, that, that separates your love towards God. But this is speaking about God's love towards you. That even in, when we fall and fail, God is there loving you through it. And again, bringing you back to a place of repentance. Because that's the way he works with his kids. And we see here that there are things in here that, that could separate us from loving him, but nothing from him loving us. And Paul lists in verse 35 seven experiences that have no power to separate us from God's love. Look at, let's, let's look at these in, uh, just briefly. The first thing he says here, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? First thing, shall tribulation. The, the word tribulation means pressure. And it's an interesting word because it carries the idea of being squeezed or placed under pressure. How many of you in here have been pressured by life, in life? Raise your hand. How many of you guys have gone through pressure? I think everybody should. If you haven't, I want to meet with you afterwards. What is, what, 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 how do you do that? Everybody here goes through pressure. The tribulation, he says it very clearly here. It's the kind of adversity that is common to all people. There's a lot of people being pressured due to finances, unemployment, health issues. He says those experiences cannot separate you from God's love. The second thing he says is distress. Refers to being strictly confined in a narrow, difficult place or being helplessly hemmed in by one's circumstances. You guys remember Paul and Silas in the book of Acts when they were thrown in prison. 
They were literally thrown in socks. They were put in stocks. It was an uncomfortable position. It was just, it, it was just probably horrible, and it was a dark place. They were at God's mercy. There's nothing that they can do. They, they didn't have the power to break those chains. So what did they do? Cry out to God and say, God, why are you against us? Do you really love us? What did they do? They started singing hymns. They started praising God. Isn't that crazy? They start singing. Do you sing to God when you're going through a hard time in your life? Probably not, right? These guys are totally praising God, and God, through that praise, the power of praise, they were basically miraculously cut loose. Amazing. And we see here that this distress, being confined, being in a difficult place, he says, even that does not separate you from God's love. Another one here, he says, persecution, speaking of suffering, because you are a follower of Christ. Matthew 5.10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he says, famine, hunger, when you're hungry, that doesn't separate you from God's love. Nakedness, being in need materially. He says peril refers to danger in general, obviously, speaking of danger from mistreatment. And the last thing he says is sword. Notice it says here, he says, or sword, suggesting murder or being killed. That won't separate you from God's love. You know that Paul experienced the first six, and he was always threatened by the seven, by the seventh one. He experienced all the other first, the first six, he experienced them firsthand, but he was always threatened by that last one. People wanted to kill him. And we see here, he speaks from experience that these things stated in increasing intensity do not separate Christians from God's love. And we see that God himself has confirmed it through this. And he says in verse 36, he uses this example of, 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 of this. He says, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, Christians should not be surprised when they are mistreated for Christ's sake. In fact, Paul was the one who told Timothy this. He said, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I mean, isn't that what you experience sometimes as Christians? Maybe at your work, at your, you know, place of employment. Maybe you have non-Christian family members that make fun of you. I mean, I've gone through that. I've had co-workers make fun of me. I mean, it's just one of those things that happens because we're Christians. And, and, and we see that, that it's very clear here that Paul says, listen, we're like sheep to the slaughter. Christians, you know, we're, we're, we're like, you know, uh, people are always picking on us. You know what I'm saying? And that's just a fact. That's a reality here when it comes to the Christian faith. But he makes it clear, though, in verse 37, yet in all these things, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More, more than conquerors. That phrase, more than conqueror, means to overconquer or to conquer completely without any real threat to personal life or death. We are more than conquerors. In other words, you are a super conqueror. You are a super conqueror. No wonder James says in James 1.22, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because you're like, what are you talking about? Count it all joy. I don't count it all joy. That's the last thing I do. Because you're more than conquer. You can conquer this in Christ. And, 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 and this is what people see sometimes in our lives. Your unsaved friends or family members, when they know you're going through a hard time in your life, and they see you praising Jesus, still reading your Bible, praying over things and whatnot, they're like, you still are good with God, knowing that you're going through what you're going through? Yes, I am. They're blown away. We're more than conquerors, even in the midst of a trial, like Casting Crown's old, that old song, which is an amazing song, I will praise you in this storm. We can still do that because of Christ, because of the power and the strength he gives us. I like what one man said. He said this, we overwhelmingly conquer by coming out of troubles stronger than when they first threatened us. More than conquerors, super conquerors. And then he gets into something interesting in verses 38 and 39. A list of dimensions of created things. Notice what he says. He says, For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So when he says death and life, 
earthly things, the two things that we fear most, living and dying, will not separate us from God's love. God's love is strong. And then he says angels and principalities. If you're an angel fan, God still loves you. <laughs> like that one, huh? And I'm wearing red, right? But it's not red, it's maroon. <laughs> celestial beings, celestial beings, things that you don't see. And then he says, notice, he says, in all these things, I love how he finishes it. He says, in all these things, he says, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. You know, we can spend weeks just in this chapter. I hope I did justice. Listen, how are you supposed to respond to this text? How are we supposed to respond to this amazing love of God? Simply like this. You can live with confidence and live without fear. Living with confidence and without fear. That's how you're supposed to respond to God's love. There's no fear in knowing God. You, you shouldn't be terrified. The fear as far as reverence to who he is, a respect, but you can live without fear and you can live with confidence. Listen to what John said. John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter uh, 4, verse 17. He says this, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The fear of thinking that God doesn't love you anymore should be thrown out the window after this text. And sometimes you wonder, does God really love me? Listen, according to this text, he loves you. You know, I was reading a story about this professor, and uh, it was actually a, um, a postgraduate uh, class, a seminary class, and they had this brilliant theologian, well-respected theologian, and the class was excited to have this man in their class as a guest speaker. And the class asked this big theologian the question, what is the greatest truth in all your studies you have ever come across? Wow. What a question, right? This was his response. It is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Wow. I thought it was about soteriology. Amen, right? Amazing. A man who had so much knowledge of theology said, I could sum all this up by saying that God loves me. Listen, guys, God is for you, not against you. God loves you. It's that simple. God loves you. It's that simple. That should actually drive you to pray. It should drive you to talk to God every single day because according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, not of judgment, of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. Because I know that Jesus loves me so much, it should drive me to say, Lord, how are you? Lord, help me. Because he will never push you away. He's always attentive to your needs. He's there for you. God is on our side. God loves us. We need to understand these three big no-nos. In Christ, there's no opposition. In Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, there is no separation between his love towards you. It's that simple, yet it's very powerful. And yet, we sometimes forget this because life sometimes will kick us in the teeth, right? Sometimes, and we forget these things, but it's so important for us to understand and grasp these things. If you grasp this, your life will be transformed even more, changed, as you live your life without fear and with confidence as a Christian. If you're not a Christian and you're just right now listening and you're like, I didn't know about this. Wow, God loves me. You know what? If you're a non-Christian, God loves you. John 3.16, that's my proof text, that God loves you if you're not a Christian here today. However, he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He loves you enough to say, you need to get right with me. 
You need to get saved. You need to, you need to ask for forgiveness of your sins because I want to save you. I don't want no one to perish, but I want everyone to come to repentance, to come to that understanding of my son, Jesus Christ. And perhaps you're here and maybe you're just not walking with Jesus. Maybe you're just your first time coming back to church. And you're like, I'm glad I'm here. Well, listen, if you're here and you're like, I need to get right with the Lord, I'm going to give you that opportunity today. If you have never experienced God's love, or perhaps something has stole that love that you once had, that you once experienced the love that God has towards you, today, make things right with God. Something happened along the way here. I want to give you that opportunity this morning because I want everyone here, as they walk out, to have confidence in their walk with Christ, especially if you're not even a Christian. Would you guys please stand? The worship team is going to be coming out here to do a song. And during that song, listen, guys, I am going to give you the opportunity for everyone that's here who needs to get right with God. Listen, you just heard that God loves you. Don't be afraid of him. You should come to him to say, I want to come to a loving God. I want my life right with God. I am done living the way I'm living. It's time to be real. And you're coming to a God who truly loves you, a God who wants to give you a life in his son.